Jesus the Black, Saint Arsenius. So the, there are so many uh, great examples and great sayings about silence and how those true fathers lived silence in the true in its true meaning. So uh, a few of the things that we want to mention here. Uh, one of the things on solitude first to complete the solitude portion um, as you see here it gives birth to compassion we kind of touched on that when we say uh, getting into that level of relationship with God it will getting into that depth it's not separating from people it's not taking us away from people it's not out of selfishness that we do that it's actually the furnace the uh, the uh, the place where we're gonna actually have more compassion towards people. Uh, so we can say that solitude and silence, they give birth to compassion. And why that happens? Simply because we stop measuring our value and our meaning using others' yardsticks. So sometimes we put ourselves in competitions with others because we compare ourselves to others. So that right away drop the compassion, that right away take away the compassion. So when we stop measuring ourselves, when we stop caring about how, how do I look in others' eyes, mm -hmm. it's then uh, like one of the main uh, barriers to be open to this other got dropped down. I'll give you an example. They say, there is a saying that, uh, that they say in Egypt, the only, the, it's, it's like a, uh, a social saying, it's not really a Christian saying, but I'm going to use it and get out of it with a Christian concept. In Egypt they say the only person that I want to be better than me is my son. This is a social saying. It's not really a Christian concept, right? Because I should I should be like the others is, is, is my, my, my companion in Christ's body, so I should be happy for others to be better than me. So once I get to that point where I consider all the others are part of Christ's body, then it's okay not to get in a competition with others, not to compare myself to others. I'm talking on a, a little bit of a, a level, level that, that you only get to experience into that uh, deep, uh, deep scale. You just don't don't just stop measuring yourself according to others your stick you also stop measuring others and you stop judging others when you when you get into that point so judgment usually creates that distance you have that barrier between you and the person that you judged so if if we are saying that when you at your uh, solitude when you are at the journey to to get to that depth when you are working on stopping this judgment and stopping this measuring, then it becomes much, much easier to be one with others, to be compassion, to show compassion to others. St. Moses the Black once said, to die to someone's neighbor is to bear your own faults. To die to someone else's neighbor is to bear your own faults, not to pay attention to anyone else. I'm not even paying attention to what, what others are doing. I'm dying to my neighbor. I'm so my neighbor to me is, is I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into that exercise of measuring and comparing and judging. And he continues and saying it's fully for a man who has a dead person in his house to leave him there and go weep over his neighbor's dead. So it's it's uh, it, it's uh, like a simple example, uh, as if he's saying, oh, "I I have my I have my dead person to worry about," and then I dare to compare myself to others, and start weeping and starting saying, "Oh my God, this person, is, my neighbor is so and so." Silence. One of the things that the father said about silence as well that it guards the fire. Within. Remember, we said that solitude is the furnace of transformation. So, continuing on that idea, that's the furnace, the, 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 the fire of the Holy Spirit, where it continues to burn within me and transform me to, from glory to glory. So, the Father said that silence is, is what guards that fire within. And one example I came across. Imagine if the door of a steam bath is kept open all the time. 
You'll never have steam. You'll never have fire. The heat will be escaping all the time. So the fathers say that silence closing that mouth keep and guard the internal the internal fire. By the way, this is not just we're not just talking about the physical silence. We're not talking just the, we're not just talking about not talking. We're talking about the mind, silencing the mind. Pope Shenouda the third, he had a great a great saying about this. Uh, if we if we put it in, you you will be able to grasp that concept. Remember what Pope, Pope Shenouda said about silence? He said, "Silence your mouth, so that your heart can talk, and silence your heart, so that your God can talk." So it's seen that sequence, and it follows the same sequence. It's not that empty silence. So it's not the silence of embarrassment. It's not the silence of awkwardness. Because if you talk to someone, I'll give an example. This is why uh, we're going against the grain of the world. If, if you are in a, in a corporate setup or a meeting or something, they actually teach that in corporate setup. Do not let your meeting go with an awkward, silent moment. That's, that's a, a no-no in, in the corporate side. Like To have a productive meaning, you shouldn't have any silence, awkward silence during your meeting. So that's why I'm saying we're going against the green because this is a different silence that we're talking about. It's not about emptiness. It's not about silence because we don't have anything to say. It's not about silence because I'm embarrassed or ashamed. It's a different silence. It's not emptiness or absence. It's fullness and presence. I'll, I'll remind me, I'll share with you a, a small story that happened to me in Abu Nakaras when we were on our 40 days in, uh, in the monastery. It's not a silence about embarrassment or shame. Totally, totally not. It's actually divine presence. And we link it with the statement that Pope Shenouda said, that silence is, is the intro for God to talk. So another, another uh, means that God himself and St. Paul highlights uh, how God uses different ways to speak, not just through physical words and sentences. You see Hebrew here, God who at various times in the various ways spoke in times and literally spoke, spoke to, to, to prophets, to fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So the son is actually a manifestation of God talk. So just being in presence, in, in God's presence, in the Son's presence, is a manifestation of a dialogue that the Father wants to have with us. <coughs> so as a conclusion, so we can start the, the next topic, the Desert Fathers did not think of solitude as being alone. That was not their concept of solitude. They rather thought about solitude as being alone with God. You're not there thinking about nothing. You're not there. Uh, you don't want to dis disturb you. You're not there just to, to clear your mind. On the contrary, you are there on an appointment with God. This is solitude definitions to the fathers. And also, they thought about silence as not just not speaking, but rather listening to God. So silence, the, the, the effect of silence that we're looking for, uh, or God's talking to us, emerge out of silence and get us back there. So this is kind of like a conclusion for these two things that will help us go through our journey to the depth. Uh, what I would like to talk about next is uh, another good question with the how question. Okay, so this is kind of still some sort of knowledge or experience, but am I alone into this? Is it just up to me to try an error and, and, and see what works and what, what doesn't? Is there a, a sketch or a, a guide that I could follow? So I think it's appropriate to talk about if the first uh, 
If we looked at Peter's experience when he received the commands launch into the deep, so the regular or the normal response that we should have is, okay, Lord, guide me to the deep. How can I get there? Guide me to the deep. Peter received a direct order, launch into the deep. So we're going to talk about guide me into the deep. How can I get there? Am I alone in this or do I have a helper? Do I have a supporter to, to, to help me through that journey? Again, as a reminder, we're not after serenity. We're not after temporary escaping from, from our hardships. We're not depleted and we're looking for recharging. We, are, we need to, to establish this together, that when we say, God, take us to the deep, that means in, that we need support in this world. As, as per John 17, he prayed and said, do not, I do not pray for, to, to, for them to be taken out of the world, but I pray that you preserve them and be with them in the world. So this is basically what we're asking guide us to get to that deep, to get to that peace, to find that uh, rest in you, but in the world, at the midst of the stormy weather, in the midst of my work, in the midst of my um, babysitting, uh, kids, uh, short, everything. So, we wanna, I want to go on a small exercise with you. Okay? So we're going to go a small exercise throughout the Bible. We are after that peace that depth because often time I get asked does having a relationship with God means that I will have no problems or all my problems will be gone and I'll be happy all the way I hear that people who live with God should be always happy I'm not happy something must be wrong I get that all the time so what should be the, th the sign if I have a good relationship or a deep relationship with God so let's go have that small exercise we're gonna go look into the scripture we're gonna find peace let's say that we want to look for peace we're after that deep peaceful relationship with God so let's try to find some verses that has peace in it in Romans 14 for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit okay good so this is a mention of peace and joy. This is what we after, right? We're after peace and joy, okay? But there is a third element that showed up here, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's, let's try to find more. But I'm, I'm giving you a hint. The more we look for peace and joy, guess what? You'll always find the Holy Spirit. I'll prove it for you. So notice that that triangle, peace and joy and Holy Spirit. We saw one verse, I'll show you more. When the Holy Spirit is mentioned, peace and joy are mentioned as well. So in Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Again, the joy and the Holy Spirit are mentioned together. Very good, we're after something here. This is what we're after, right? Joy, peace, deep relationship, full of joy and full of peace. Galatians 5.22, we memorize them since we were young, fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, guess what? Joy and peace. Again, joy and peace are mentioned with the Holy Spirit. There must be a relation. صح? They must be connected somehow. That's not just it. Romans 14, the verse that we just read. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. One more. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is definitely a relation. There must be a relation. I've showed you so many, and actually there are more. So what is the relationship? What is the relationship between joy, peace, and the Holy Spirit? If this was the case, if the Holy Spirit is linked to joy, it should have been called what? The joyful spirit, the joy-giving spirit, the peaceful spirit. What did the Lord Jesus Christ call the Holy Spirit? 
peaceful, joyful, the joy giving. What was the Holy Spirit called by our Lord Jesus Christ? The comfort. This is kind of like a shock. It's not a bit expected. If it is always mentioned with joy and peace, and then when we call him, we call him the comforter, and muazzi Where do you go to, to offer comfort and ta'zayah? It looks like there is a fi aza, fi fi had the mat. There is a dead, the, the, there is a death here. So, what is going on? Can we have joy and comfort? Can we have joy and peace? Min min had the ismul muazzi. There is there is some sort of a link here that we need to follow to find out exactly what are the boundaries of that deep relationship. It's not, it's like if, if I'm in a deep relationship, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be walking, laughing with no problems and with no issues. That's not a deep relationship with God. So let's try to find out. The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, this is Jesus Christ talking to the disciples, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And I'll bring, and I'll bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. That's John 14.26 I want to show you this equation to try to figure out how come comfort is linked to the joy and peace this is in, in Timothy uh, no this is not Timothy Thessalonians you this is St. Paul talking to the Thessalonians you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Another verse that has the three, but I guess this, this gives us the hint, what's the link? So he's talking to the Thessalonians saying you became imitator to us I can see you and what, what you have done is similar to what I've done what have you done you've received the word of God you've received the, the news in the midst of severe suffering because there was a lot of persecution for these people when 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 St. Paul was there and even when St. Paul left the, the houses, all the converts, the Jew who converted to Christianity were severely persecuted. Yet he's telling you, he's telling them, although you had these severe sufferings, you received the word of God with joy, given by the Holy Spirit. Then we, can, we could read that equation. The Holy Spirit, the comforter. Comfort is, comforter is not having no problems. It's not being happy all the time. Comfort equals joy and peace, as proven by the verses, in suffering, in the midst of suffering. Does that picture that we saw at the beginning, does that picture make sense right now? So we could see that this little guy here is comforted. It's, comfort. it's cold outside, it's stormy, it's, it's very, very troubling. Yet, he's managed to find his his peace and comfort and solitude. C can you link it now? Okay, so. So we said, remember that equation. Comfort equals joy plus peace in the midst of suffering. We have memorized two verses ever since we were Sunday school kids. The first one. I don't know. Whoever wants to be my disciple must, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross, underlined, daily. And follow me. That's Luke 9, 23. Pick up their cross daily. What do you think of carrying a cross? Is that a joyful event? Hmm? It's, it's suffering, it's painful, right? Carry the cross. And by the way, the cross back then was not our glory and pride. The cross back then, when Jesus told them that verse, he was referring to what? A death tool. A tool that used to end the life of a criminal. So as if he's telling them, literally the translation back then, 
Now we get it carrying the cross. Yes, it's a blessing. It's a glory. It's imitating, partaking in Jesus' suffering. Back then, it, it meant one thing. Carry the cross daily. Die every day. That's simply what it meant. Sahabuna? So, so that verse we memorized. The other one says, by, again, St. Paul, Rejoice in the Lord always. Hold on, there is a contradiction. I have one commandment to carry the cross, which is a death, like carry death every day. And I have another commandment to say rejoice always. And I think probably when St. Paul was talking or writing this and people said, what do you mean rejoice always? So then he said, yes, I will say it again. Yes, I mean it. I mean it, rejoice always. Probably someone may be asking, you mean like, are you sure always rejoice always? Yes, that's it. And again, I say, he knew he was, he was talking against the grain of the world. Saying the old, uh, the, the joy of tribulation rather than the danger of pleasure. Gamila, <laughs> Gamila. The joy of tribulation rather than is better than the danger of, of a pleasure. Yes, it's amazing. So simply put, we can follow the same sequence. Getting into that deep. To get into the deep, we get we need a guide. And that guide was given to us. That guide is called the comforter. And he was called a comforter for a reason. Because getting into the deep requires following him, carrying her cro his cross. And not just that, accepting to carry the cross, this will give true joys, joy. Just as Abuna was saying, a, a true joy is through turbulation. Simply, the true joy the true everlasting joy is is born out of suffering and guess what the next slide is gonna tell us that jesus christ himself explained that concept how true joy emerges from suffering and death he gave two metaphors for that or two examples but before we get to that the next slide was another verse yeah it's there saint paul himself said I don't have the English for this one. لذلك أصر بالضعفات والشتائم والضرورات والاضطهادات والضيقات لأجل المسيح لأني حينز أنا ضعيف حينز. He's saying basically, I find pleasure. You should like again. We're going against the green of the world. So if you when you say I find pleasure, you could probably say I find pleasure in appreciation, in success, in. Um, in, in, in fulfilling my goals, in, in being with my family. And again, all these are good things. Don't get me wrong. These are not a bad thing. Yet St. Paul chose to say, I find pleasure. This is St. Paul pleasure. Weaknesses, curses, persecution, hardships. But he adds for Christ. Because I could be, I could be cursed because I'm a bad person, not because of Christ. So he just adds for the sake of Christ. I'm, I'm going to go back to the example where I mentioned that Jesus Christ himself gave that metaphor. Remember, Jesus Christ talked about the, uh, the what? The mustard seed. The wind grid and the mustard seed. Uh, I don't know if you recall... Back in Egypt, we used to do that stuff a lot. Uh, close to Christmas time, we would get like plates and cotton, and we get some some seeds, right? Who who did that before? Like, I was a big fan of this thing. Like, I'm a big fan of watching this. Yeah, so I'm glad a lot of you have done that. So uh, usually, uh, beans and and ats and and helba helba was good one too. Helba was really good one. Yes. But my, my favorite, and I'll tell you why it wasn't my favorite, was beans, habbat al At the beginning, it was fresh and puffy 
and big and full of juices and food, right? What happens day after day? You, you start seeing shrinking, yeah. shrinking, and, and the skin is like tr torn. Yes. And after a few days, instead of being puffy and this big, it goes like shrunk. shrunk. Yeah. And then after that, what happens to that? It rottens, it dies. But before it dies, something else was born. A new beautiful uh, uh, green plant with nice leaves and and you look at the seed, it's totally dead. It's rotten. This is what Jesus Christ exactly said. He said, if that seed did not fall into the soil and dies, we don't get the joy of this green, full, uh, fruitful new plant. As if he's establishing a law. Fruits requires death. Fruits requires suffering. Canadians, they figure it out. No pain, no, no gain. It's actually, this is a spiritual law. It's not, it's not a gym law. It's not for, for the treadmill. It's not for the dumbbells. This is a spiritual law. No suffering, no, if, if, the, if, if there's no death, there will be no gain. He actually gave us another excellent metaphor. I don't know if you can see that, it's not clear. The first, this first picture is a woman giving birth. And without epidural, it's actually, they didn't get a chance to give her epidural. So she is giving birth and she is in severe pain, right? Jesus Christ said that. The woman, when she gives birth, she's sad and she's in suffering. But what happens after? After she gives birth, it's the same woman. She's now joyful because she brought life. She became fruitful. So it's the same law. Out of, out of death and out of pain, out of suffering, comes joy. This is the Christian joy that we're after. Because this is not bounded by conditions. This, is, this joy and, and peace doesn't get shaken by the condition surrounding us. It's actually above, above the condition and the surroundings. So it's a spiritual law. Pain and suffering are required to get fruits which give joy. So within that context, the comfort of the Holy Spirit during tough times result in peace and joy. Remember I told you earlier this morning, you find the same hardship, the same trial, the same uh, problem or issue. Uh, two different families or two different personalities, they go through it. One of them will crash, get disappointed, and, and, and get totally, totally uh, down. And the other is able to go through it and carry through because he's got that guidance of the Holy Spirit, that comfort. Time. What do we need to do? So I think this is the last slide. It's going to be short today. So we.